Hey guys, it's Brian Rosner with Biomed Publishing Group. Uh, I'm going to be making another video for you today about uh, an interesting topic in mold avoidance, and that is doing mold avoidance with a family. Um, doing mold avoidance with a family is sort of an area that's not as well explored because um, uh, many of the mold avoider experts um, that I have learned a lot from don't have um, kids, and so there's some other challenges. I mean, I could make 50 videos about this topic, but uh, one of the challenges that you deal with is um, people have different levels of reactivity and have different levels of sickness. So the, the really reactive people may need a different level of mold avoidance than the people who are not so reactive. Um, so finding the common ground is really important because I don't really believe in the philosophy of living apart from your family. We actually did try that. I lived apart from them for six months, and I thought it was just going to be six months and then we get back together and everything's going to be fine. Uh, but actually it was a lot harder than that. Um, relationships changed. My wife got really worn out from taking care of the kids by herself. The kids were emotionally traumatized by all the transition. Um, there was a massive amount of mental energy wasted and spent. Um, there was a ton of financial stress because we were paying for two lifestyles, two living arrangements, myself and my wife. People were asking us if we were divorced, our marriage suffered. Um, so I've actually decided that I think it's better that my family pursue a higher level of mold avoidance than what they really would need in order for us all to be together. And also, you know, my family does have some degree of mold sickness, so it's probably beneficial to them. When we separated, they all started to get sick again in the living environment that they were in. So it, it was kind of a fantasy to assume that they didn't need mold avoidance either. So there's sort of this initial period in mold avoidance where everyone needs to get clear. There's a lot of detoxing. Uh, mold is just coming out of you like a waterfall. And for that period, I think it's just best for everyone to stay together in the family, sort of hunker down, be in a clear place. Um, I like being in disposable housing. You guys can see I'm in my travel trailer here. Um, I call this disposable housing because it, the travel trailers are such a blessing. You can see my kids' pictures on the wall. I mean, you really can move around, find clean air, learn mold avoidance. Um, you can do, uh, and then you can just trade them in if you need to. And I know people are like, well, it's expensive to trade in a travel trailer. Well, yeah, but campgrounds are 10 or 20 bucks a night or 30 bucks with power. And, um, and so you save a lot of money on rent or a mortgage. So you can save up your money for trading in your, your travel trailer. Right now I am at a place that is, uh, 6,500 feet in elevation. <clears throat> it's in the teens right now and snowing. So the other thing I like about a travel trailer is that you can uh, live in comfort. We have a four-year-old. We're not tent camping with a four-year-old. Sorry, it's, some people can do that. We're not going to do it. I, we, we tent camp for fun, uh, but we don't tent camp long-term in different weather with three kids. It's just, I would kind of rather die. <laughs> and I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, tent camping is a great way to do mold avoidance. It's a great way to do a mold avoidance sabbatical. It's cheap. <clears throat> It's, it's easy, anybody can do it. If, you're, if your gear gets contaminated, you can throw it away. So I am not against tent camping, just for the record. I think tent camping is a huge asset to mold avoidance, and we did a lot of that in the beginning too. What I'm talking about more is the long-term uh, two or three years of mold avoidance in different climates, different weather, with homeschool, with people getting the flu, um, you know, it, it, I'm not talking about just doing mold avoidance a sabbatical or going out for a couple weeks or a month or two. That's not what I'm talking about. So people might misinterpret that and say that I'm against tent camping. I'm not at all. I'm just talking about, you know, longer term, you know, you're not quite well enough to live in a house yet. Um, so you need to have a different environment. So that, that's what I'm referring to. I do think that tent camping is, is really good for a lot of, uh, reasons in mold avoidance. But anyway, um, back to the original topic. Um, what we kind of started to hone in on as our, our symptoms decrease and we started to feel better is that we don't really want to be huddled up in a trailer anymore in the middle of nowhere. Um, the kids need stuff to do. They need activities. They need friends. So what you kind of run into is trying to find this middle ground of um, how do you, how does the sickest person in the family, which happens to be me, um, although I'm much better now than I used to be, way better, but how do I get my needs met and the family get their needs met? And so what we've kind of honed in on, I'm trying to get rid of this glare here, There might it might be impossible to get rid of the glare because it's snowing and everything's super bright, but um, how do you meet everybody's needs while still staying together? 
that's the key is staying together. And so what I've sort of honed in on is buying or renting property where the air and the environment is clean enough for the one person and for the other family members to heal because they've been sick too, but also that's close enough to civilization so my wife can run into town um, with the kids and go to church, uh, go to activities, meet friends, go to the park, you know, do whatever they want to do. Um, so what I've sort of, you know, what I want to talk to you guys about is some strategies for doing that. And one of the, the very most important thing is to have a good decontamination protocol in place. You know, right now my wife is out with the kids um, in, the, in the nearest city and they're going to come back and potentially have some contamination issues. So um, showers are a really good thing. Um, <clears throat> this campground that we're at now has a separate shower facility, which is great. They can shower. They don't have to think about, you know, being inside the trailer. They can just take showers and do what they need to do and then come back to the trailer. I usually have them wear their contaminated clothes all the way to the doorstep of the trailer, even after they've showered. And even though that might get a little contamination in here, it allows me to keep their clean trailer clothes in the trailer so that I know they haven't been dropped on the floor in the bathroom or anything weird hasn't happened to them. I mean, there's, there's no perfect way to do this, guys. If you're living with your family, there's gonna be more contamination than living alone. And so it's sort of a philosophical question. You know, I could go off and live alone somewhere and, and be in a much smaller RV and never deal with any contamination, but I wanna be with my family. So it's worth it to me to take some risks that I wouldn't otherwise take. Um, <clears throat> so that's one thing. The other thing is vehicles. Vehicles become a big problem because you can't always keep your vehicles clean because your vehicles by definition, you can't take a shower and do laundry when you're in the middle of a city. You know, you come out of a moldy school or library or play date or something. What are you going to do? You got three kids. You're going to get in your car and you're going to contaminate your car. So the, the strategy that I've sort of developed that is, um, I haven't really planned this on in, intentionally, but it's just sort of what's happened is that my wife's car is sort of the sacrificial lamb and my truck is sort of the cleaner vehicle. So if we're going to go somewhere as a family that's relatively clean, like we're going to go on a hike or we're going to go somewhere where I can sense if the buildings are good or bad and I can sort of supervise everybody, then we take my truck and it's sort of a more careful level of contamination. If my wife's taking the kids somewhere, she takes her car and I don't hound her about contamination and I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not emotionally, you know, berating her about, you know, keeping the car clean. It, it just is what it is. You know, you can't control it. So she goes out and does that. Um, the key is that we keep our inside environment where we live right now, which is the trailer, really clean um, and decontaminated. Eventually, I would like to, if we buy our own land, I would like to have a few different buildings on the land that can have different contamination levels. Uh, like for example, um, you know, like uh, a separate building where they can play with toys and do homeschool and have friends over. And I maybe, I'll, I'll go in that building, but I won't sit down on the couch and roll around on the floor and, you know, lick the walls or whatever, you know. So um, separate buildings would be nice eventually, would solve a lot of problems. When we have our own property, I would like to have a separate laundry room and shower area, maybe like a little shed that I install plumbing in where we can decontaminate, take showers, um, have a washing machine and just not worry about if that's contaminated. And then maybe we'll keep our RV or have some other building that will be um, more clean and more decontaminated. I also find, if you guys might think this is silly, but I also find one strategy is even though I live in the trailer, I don't touch a lot in here. Um, I have a little metal chair right over here, a uh, folding chair, and that's all I sit on. And at first it was depressing. It was like, oh my gosh, I don't get to sit on our luxurious leather couch. And when we eat dinner, I don't sit on the dinette cushions. Oh, what a bummer. But eventually I just kind of said, you know what? I don't really care. It's worth it to be with my family. Um, I don't need to sit on those cozy places. I just sit on my metal chair when we're watching a movie. You know, we have a nice TV in here when we're eating dinner. And I do wrestle with the kids and I play and we have a good time. But I'm just a little bit careful about what clothing I'm wearing and how I'm going about it. Um, so that's, you know, I, I'm, I sort of micromanage my internal trailer environment with contamination and just making small choices throughout the day that keeps me a little bit separated. We've had um, some toxins on the floor in here before, some mold toxins that have been a problem. So I have sandals in here that I can wear if I need to. 
So it's kind of, you know, micromanaging your space a little bit. I mean, I could just not let my family go anywhere, have zero contamination, keep my kids locked up in the trailer and do nothing. But that's not the life that we want to live. You know, they, they need to grow up and go out and have experiences and do stuff. So, um, you know, we can always trade in the trailer if we need to. Um, life goes on. And like I said, the financial part of that actually is a little more feasible than you might think. Everybody thinks, oh, it's a trailer. It's a big, expensive thing. No, it's not. It's a commodity. Some of these trailers cost less than cheap cars. So just because it's big and it has all these amenities in a kitchen, don't assume that it's expensive like a house is. It isn't necessarily. This trailer we paid about $20,000 for brand new. And, you know, that it's not that much money um, compared to, you know, we were renting a place that was moldy that was $3,000 a month in California and you know we we wasted all that money on rent so the trailer is a really good investment another thing i'd like to talk to you when it comes to um doing mold avoidance with the family is um how to select activities um you know we we just are a little more careful about the activities that we do um we, we like to hike we like to bike we're going to try to live in a place where the outdoor uh activities are a big part of the culture you know one thing i don't want to have happen is have my kids say Dad, why can't I go do this with my friends? You know, and so we're going to try to pick a place to live where the friends and the culture and the people are outdoorsy people. Um, you know, places where mountain biking and skiing and river rafting and, you know, outdoor things are popular so that when we're outside with the kids, it'll just sort of be normal. Um, you know, as opposed to maybe a place that gets to be 120 degrees in the summer and all everybody do, does is sit indoors, you know, because it's too hot. Or, or a place like Alaska, um, where maybe the outdoor air is great, but six months out of the year, everybody's indoors because there's nowhere else to go. So I think picking a, a good climate is an important thing. And I think that's really, I want to try to keep this video short. I think some of my videos have been a little bit too long. Um, but, uh, you know, I, the basic um, goal here is to sort of stay together as a family and get everyone's needs met. And you're going to make mistakes in the beginning, so don't be too hard on yourself and don't invest too much money in setting things up because probably what will happen is you'll, you know, set something up wrong and you'll have a, an issue and you'll need to throw some stuff away or change your setup. So just kind of be um, lighthearted about it in the beginning. Um, a friend of mine and, and a mentor of mine, they did hotels for the first year and they didn't have a lot of clothing and belongings. And it's like, oh, well, you know, whatever happens, happens. There's not a lot to lose. Um, so yeah, you know, keep it kind of lighthearted. Don't stress about it too much. That's also why I think tent camping is great in the beginning. If you could go somewhere in the summer and, uh, do some tent camping, um, you, there's just less at stake because, um, uh, you, you know, it's easier to get new tents and, you know, if you could do it in good weather and there's campground facilities, I also really recommend trying to stay in places where you can use other people's facilities in the very beginning, you know, bathrooms, kitchens, whatever. You, you got to remember, most people aren't sensitive to mold. So if you have, you know, you know, I don't think you have to worry about, you know, contaminating someone's campground or bathroom or something. Maybe another mold avoider would have a problem, but as, as a larger ethical, you know, situation, it's, it's not an issue. So, you know, if you can use rental properties or hotels or campgrounds and kind of learn it that way that's good uh, but yeah doing mold avoidance with the family it's a whole different ball game than normal mold avoidance and um it's really something i think that we need to talk more about because a lot of us do have families and what are we supposed to do you know i think selling our home and going full-time on the road was one of the best things that we ever did because it really reduced our bills our, our financial burden um, being all together also reduced our financial burden when we were apart, trying to do it that way, you know, paying for um, two sets of grocery shopping and rent. And, you know, now we are all in the trailer and we are all together. So whatever expenses we do have, at least they're consolidated all into one um, situation. So I'll be doing more videos like this, you guys, on uh, family mold avoidance. And I would love to hear your comments in the comments section. Um, I have a new book coming out, uh, that'll be out on, on the topic of mold avoidance in a couple of months here. Uh, and so I think that's it. Hope you guys are doing well.